Okay. You're ready. So okay, Melinda's joining us. Rebecca. So shall I start, Tammy? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, welcome I, all aboard. You want to go to camera? I know almost everyone and hope to get to know those I don't know. But this is the St. Matthew ECC Church weekly Bible study. And we this will run for 18 weeks, so it will take us up to the summer, actually. Mm. And uh, I think that our schedule is, every, I looked at the schedule, I don't think we miss any because of uh, holidays or vacations, but we'll keep that on track. I'm Mother Martha, and my co-leader is Father John. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Oh, John, I haven't met you before. This is my wife, without whom I could not do any Bring of your, this, because I'm no stupid. So, and then That's Deacon true. Tammy is helping no. also yeah. with the technical work. Okay, I'm just going to um, hop in here for a second. I'm going to mute everyone so that we could just hear Martha. Okay, and then we'll give you a chance to... Uh, ask questions at certain points. We'll have you raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Is that okay? Leave Father John unmuted. Okay, no problem. Okay, very good. Okay, short prayer. We are going to pray first and ask the Lord to open our eyes to his message in a new way. Help us to understand deeper than before, more completely than before, the beautiful words that your servant, John Mark, gave us in this holy gospel. We thank you for everyone coming and for all who will listen later on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let me say, let me just start with a, a brief overview introduction of materials. I sent out the handouts, which some of you have probably already picked up, but I will quickly review the uh, books that we're, uh, we're paying attention to. There are two books by a man by the name of Thomas Oden. And one is called How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind. And then there's a second book, and I don't have it here. I don't know what I did. Oh, oh I know. I sent it to John. <laughs> That's why I don't have the physical copy of it. John can show it when he gets a chance. There it is. Yeah, the... Uh, African memory of Mark, and I'll say a little bit more about these as we go on. There is a third book called A History of Christianity in Africa. And I have to tell you, before I read these books some years ago, I had no idea of the African influence on our Gospels. And so this has proven to be very enlightening to me. The other sources that we are using, uh, I am using uh, the new revised standard version of the scripture and the particular version that I'm using is an annotated New Testament by two Jewish scholars. And it's called the Jewish Annotated New Testament. Now, this is the second edition that was published in 2017. John has the earlier one from 2011, which I bequeathed him. If you think of yourself as someone who wants to continue studying scripture, over time, the, this is an incredible resource because these are two Jewish scholars 
who are well versed in the Hebrew tradition and scriptures, and they are also experts in New Testament, if you can believe it. And mm -hmm. they have attempted to make the reader aware of what the underlying thinking was of Jews during the New Testament era. So that book I find very valuable. I don't always agree with everything in it, uh, but uh, there, it is a beautiful resource as far as understanding the background at the time scriptures were written. And then another source which we will use, Father John may use this more than I do, it's part of a series by William Barclay, and this particular volume has to do with studying uh, the book of Mark. This was written in 1975, but it's very powerful and still very good. You can buy secondhand copies for not very much. All these other books are available through Kindle, or through paperbacks, but I will tell you there's none of them that you have to have for this course. It's strictly up to you. I will give you summaries, synopses, uh, information that you need taken from these books. You don't have to run out and spend a hundred bucks on books, but if you're particularly interested and want to go in depth these are good books, and they're really worth your while. Now, why... Martha, can, can yeah. I interrupt just one Please. second about Barclay? Please. I, I just want to um, let everyone know that Barclay, uh, his original works were written in the uh, early 50s, and some of the language is... Uh, language that may that that may uh, ruffle some of your feathers that's uh it's very chauvinistic and very eurocentric in a way so uh if you can get past that and get to the meat of what he's saying um it's really worth it but just be aware that uh, he uses a lot of uh male oriented and masculine uh definitions throughout that's true. Thank you for that input so that everyone knows what you're <clears throat> getting into. Well, I want to talk a little bit first today, or we'll do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes at the beginning of each session talking about what we know about the African memory of Mark because there is a lot of information that we have that's not typically been taught, but I will give you my take on it and on its validity and you can take it from there. And you have several handouts already. We'll be giving you additional handouts each week, some of which will direct, rate, relate directly to the text of Mark and some which are secondary information for you to, to use. Uh, but in most of our studies, the people in seminaries in the West have had a particular approach to all of the scriptures. And those of you who have been in St. Matthew Bible studies before know that that historical critical method that underlies most of the studies in seminaries today was intended to be more objective, to help people understand actually what was the history underlying and what was the language that was used in the books and what did it mean to the, the listener at the time? And I say listener because in the first generation, very few people read. You might have one reader or one person telling the gospel story, and eventually these stories were written down. 
and then they were read because most of the population did not read. We actually, uh, in reading it silently, are in a vastly different mode than it was received by the original listeners. They heard the word, they didn't read the word. So that's important to know. But in that, that scholarship vein, that uh, really has taken over theology in the West in the last 200 years. It accomplished a lot, but it also missed a lot. And I didn't appreciate this until I started reading Thomas Oden's books. Oden is a very well-known Protestant theologian and biblical scholar. So he has earned his chops as far as the traditional historical uh, means of unearthing what might be in the scriptures. But in studying Africa, he brings up a whole realm of information that converges to tell a story that is well known in the Coptic church. It's also well known throughout every part of the African continent. It's well known in all branches of Christianity in Africa. It wasn't just one branch that had a story that they told. It was well known and it was retold over the entire African continent. And uh, this was all going on for the last 2000 years, uh, six centuries before Islam came on the scene. And here's what was the real kicker for me, that there is an African memory that can be identified. Mm -hmm. The story about John Mark, as the author of the gospel is told in virtually all of the major indigenous languages in Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that, you've got all these different languages going on in different parts of the continent, and they're telling the same story. And, you know, that information converges into a reality that there really was a story that was known that began with John Mark. And their memory is not vague or uh, just uh, simple and indefinite. It is also found in all kinds of documents that were well preserved in the African churches. They have all kinds of documents, which included like uh, stories of the saints that are preserved, stories of the, uh, well, documentation of the liturgies, which included the story of, of uh, John Mark. And there were all these narratives that converged to give the story about John Mark. Now, John Mark was born in Africa, and he, uh, as a young boy, probably came to Jerusalem. There was constant traffic back and forth between North Africa and Jerusalem in the populations. He was in a Jewish community, reportedly a Levite family, and that, that family, there was a, 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 some uh, upset and uh, distress that developed in the country uh, along about, uh, I'm forgetting the year now, but they came and uh, moved to Jerusalem to escape some of the, the conflict that was going on 
uh, from their home in Africa. So uh, it is believed that John Mark is probably the young man that is that is described in the book of Mark that uh, had a loincloth around him and was grabbed and he ran away. That may be the only personal reference uh, to him in the entire scripture. But we know uh, from many connections throughout our existing scripture, which we'll get into over the weeks, that uh, he was known by Peter and he was probably even a relative of Peter, a relative of Barnabas. When Peter escaped from prison, uh, he ran to a place of safety and it was the home of John Mark's mother. And it is believed that that was the place of the upper room for the uh, Last Supper and also for Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Now that may all be kind of hard to absorb, but we'll try to give you some of the sources and how that information evolved. But what it says to me is that we need to take into account the Jewish and the African influences on our development of our entire Christian uh, foundation, because Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels. It is the shortest, but he is quoted or used very heavily in both Luke and Matthew. They used much of Mark. Mark was the first. And there are some interesting differences between how Mark presents some things and how the later Gospels uh, present things. I think that at the time Mark was written, it was probably during or after the uh, destruction of the temple in 70 CE, because there's a certain chaos that seems to be evident in Mark. He says 17 times, and immediately, and immediately, mm -hmm. and I, I gave you a handout that Peter had developed back in 2017 on the use of that word immediately. It was like there was a, a pressure and there was this chaotic situation mm -hmm. that they were moving through in that time. And this is, uh, you know, you see less of that in the other gospels. The term immediate is mentioned a few times in the other gospels, but it's, it seems to be most predominant in Mark, <clears throat> who is in this time in which they are trying to, to come together as a community and to make sense of what happened and to remember what happened and to convey what Jesus taught them. It is said by the Coptics that, that John Mark was Peter's student and that he attempted to convey Peter's memories of what had happened. And some sources say it's kind of all mixed up. It's not in an order like in some of the later gospels but I don't think that's true. There, there is an underlying structure there that we can find. But Mark was among the disciples from the very beginning of the church in Jerusalem. We find him mentioned in Acts. He is in Antioch with the earliest leaders. We find him present in the beginning of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. And then he's present in Cyprus with Barnabas. 
And then the next time we hear from him is several years later, could be as long as a decade. He's referred to in Colossians and Philemon as being with Paul. So Paul sends greetings from Mark to Philemon, who must have known him well. Mark was apparently in Rome at that point and had some intention of visiting Asia Minor. So Mark appears to have been a close associate of Peter. And uh, when he was in Babylon, we don't know if Babylon was the refugee center of Babylon in Egypt, or if it was a code word for Rome. It could have been either one. So, and then probably Mark was in Ephesus along about CE 54, 55. And he probably was uh, in the area when uh, Paul was martyred and then later when Peter was martyred in the early 60s. So he is found all over the New Testament, but we have never really pulled it together in a way that makes sense of who this man was. And so uh, Peter may have baptized him. Peter really regarded him as a close uh, companion or protege. And Peter may have thought of him as an extended family member. We're not sure exactly of that, whether he called him my son because he was a relative or that he was a convert under uh, Peter's uh, ministry. So that gives you a start as to why I think this book is important to look at again. We studied it in 2017 with Bishop Peter, who did a great job. And I've pulled some of the handouts he did, which I will pass on to you from time to time. And they're all marked, copy marked, righted with Peter's name on them. So we will use some of that material, but we'll try to see if we can gain some new insights. What we will not do the same <clears throat> as we had done in the St. Matthew study, we will not go through every single verse of a chapter each week. It's just not feasible to do that. My experience with two or three other online studies is that people show up more often when you're limited to about a half hour. But I decided with this one, there's just really no way to do it justice in a half hour. So we've allotted, John and I have allotted up to an hour. And so we will give some background information uh, about the book of Mark. And then we'll take a look at a chapter in Mark and we'll hit three or four main ideas in each chapter. This first chapter is very long and has a lot of different things going on. So we can only hit certain ideas. Your job will be, if you can, to try to read the chapter that will be upcoming. Next week, we will look at chapter two, and we will send you a handout each week that has the scripture in it, and it's a two-column uh, handout with the scripture on one side and maybe some notes on the other with space for you to write your own notes. And we'll send those out each week for you. If you would read the chapter that's coming up, and then maybe you will have some questions, and we will uh, try to address those as well as we can. So let me stop for a minute. I've been running my mouth for a while. Are there any comments or questions that you have thus far? 
Yes, Polly. Hold on, Polly. Hi, Polly. Oh. Wait. Polly has to unmute. I can't do it on my side. Okay. Why was this? Uh, why was the information about Mark and the connection to Africa and Africa's connection to um, the Jewish faith in general? Why was it confined to Africa? Why did it not get dispersed through Jerusalem or um, Paul's uh, setup of different churches and so on? Uh, that's a good question. And some of that is Let actually me. there. John, you have a comment? I, yes, I, I would. I, I think that, um, and, and Odin talks ab about this in, in the book, in his book, but I think there's a certain uh, mindset, a certain uh, paradigm that was in place that uh, looked at um, the, uh, the, the faith as coming from north to south, from Europe to Africa, rather than going from Africa north. And I think there was maybe a certain bias, maybe a certain cultural bias that, that took place. And uh, we, we see that with many of the African saints that uh, really have never been uh, acknowledged as being African. We can talk about uh, St. Monica, who was Augustine's mother. We can talk about Augustine. We can talk about Cyprian. We can talk about Benedict. Uh, uh, many of these, uh, we say them in the litany of our saints, but uh, you know, there's no emphasis on the fact that they are anything other than a European uh, uh, saint. And the premise of the book is that there's a whole different uh, mental, spiritual, and psychological approach in Africa that is entirely a different paradigm than that which was used in Europe. And I think what has ha what happened is that it got buried. You know? <laughs> Quite frankly, you know, they say that his story is his story, and those who are the ones who are, you know, in the dominant culture at the time, they're going to uh, either ignore or spin the uh, the narrative in a way in which uh, most benefits their worldview. Yeah, I think even like Augustine with his obvious African roots, yeah. he is not thought of as African. <clears throat> the influences of Africa on the formation of our theology and on how we thought of scripture is so permeated, we don't even know where it came from. Mm -hmm. It was so used, but it was so ignored as well. And we hope to bring that back <laughs> for us to appreciate more. And that's why I thought this would be a good way. We have this in cycle B every three years, a gospel that we repeat studying. And uh, Peter did it in 2017. And here we are again, what can we do to enlarge our understanding with uh, what was going on? Any other comments or questions? Yes. Those uh, people that uh, Father John, um, that Father John listed, St. Cyprian, um, Augustine, Augustine's mother, are they all Africans? And why obviously St. Augustine? Was he black? St. Augustine's mother was uh, African. I believe she was uh, Carthaginian. Yeah, I have a, a, a picture, of, an icon of her. She's black in the icon. Right. And his father uh, was, uh, I believe, uh, a Roman. And uh, he would be then what we would consider today multiracial, biracial. And uh, oh. if we were to look at him under 21st century eyes, we would probably identify him as being a Black person. 
Interesting, huh? And St. Cyprian as well? St. Cyprian, St. No Benedict. Thank you. They, uh, there, there's this, this thought uh, process, which is one of, the, one of the things that I find it's very interesting is that somehow Northern Africa, when we talk about Libya, when we talk about Egypt, yep. we talk about Morocco, we talk about them as Mediterranean countries, which they are because they border the Mediterranean, but they are part and parcel of the continent of Africa. But somehow anything yep. that's sub-Saharan is different than things that are Northern Saharan. But we have ancient civilizations that, you know, border those uh, up and down the Nile Valley in Egypt, Somalia, Ethiopia, all of those areas have rich uh, African uh, tradition and African thought and philosophy uh, at work. But somehow that that bit of uh, that 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 bit of focus uh, has been lost. Yeah. Jenny Blue wants to say something. Who? Uh -huh. Jenny. Okay. Jenny, did you want to say Thank something? You. Yeah. Unblock her, Jenny. Um, it says I have to ask to unmute, so she must be muting herself. I can't unmute it. Okay. Can Can you hear us, Jenny? No, no, she's still muted. Yeah. Um, Jenny, if you hit your space bar, you should be able to talk. She's not seeing that. Yeah, I can't, I can't unmute her. Can we send her a text? No, you can, you can write, you can chat with Jenny. No, okay. Okay, that's something we have to solve before next time. Maybe have a little lesson on everybody muting and unmuting themselves mm -hmm. so that they can uh, uh, know how to work with this system. Okay. It works very well when we are able to, to get it. I'm so computer stupid. I can't do it by myself. <laughs> Okay. okay. It's a different. It's a. It's a different set of skills, Martha. I know, and I don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say that if she is on an iPad, she can just touch her touch the upper rim, and a little menu comes up, and she, the, yeah. that has a the mute unmute. She can just tap it. She's I don't know what something, but I can't hear it. Oh, oh it's backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Unmute. Mm -hmm. she like she's trying, but no, no, no. nothing's it's happening. Hard. Well, we will go on then. Let's focus a little bit on the first chapter of Mark. And there, there are, it is so, it's long and it's very heavy duty with a lot of important themes in it. So I encourage you to go back and read it before next week and along with chapter two. But it begins, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now that's an important term. And it's one in which it does not mean or did not mean to the Jews what we have thought it means today. There was a term son of God and son of man. And these two terms had kind of the reverse meaning of what we expect. Son of God for first century listeners was referring to his humanity. And I think you have a handout on that. Hope I gave that to you this time. Uh, two titles for Jesus. Son of God was a royal title for the king, but it did not imply 
that you were in the deity. It was a, a title that might be described, given to any Davidic king. And then son of man is actually a divine title that came from Daniel 7. And in reading that in part, I saw coming with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. When he reached the ancient of days and was presented before him, he received dominion, splendor, and kingship. All nations, peoples, and tongues will serve him. And so uh, in Daniel, the idea of son of man is a, uh, a title reflecting some, uh, some uh, concept of divinity. Yes, Tammy. So I called Jeannie and she wants to know she hasn't heard um, the term uh, or Mark being called John Mark. So where is the John Mark coming from? There, there, it shows up in scripture in a couple of places, Jeannie. I will have to look that up for you, but they refer to him as John and then they say he also known as Mark. So it does show up in the scripture. I'll try to find the exact verse for you before next time. But uh, it does seem to be the same person that we're referring to. Uh, let's see if I can quickly find it. I don't know if I can. No, I will have to look that up, but it definitely is in the New Testament where he's referred to as John and also Mark. So we'll, we'll look that up for you. One of, the, usually one of the commentaries uh, that I have read uh, indicated that uh, it was uh, an indication of of John Mark's universalism in that John would have been a traditional Jewish name and Mark or Marco Marcus, uh, Marcus would have been a Roman. Uh, yeah. so, so John Mark is indicative of his universality and his, uh, his uh, carrying through uh, the message on many different levels. Right. That's right. <clears throat> so this term in uh, the Son of God is used here referring that he is uh, a person who uh, is given uh, a title in human terms. Okay, it was important, it was common for Jews of the period to bear both a Semitic name such as John and a Greco-Roman name such as Mark. But since John was one of the most common names among Palestinian Jews and Mark was the most common in the Roman world, caution is warranted in identifying John Mark with any other John or Mark. Mm -hmm. So that's what is said. Uh, is that Wikipedia? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like John says, Father John mm -hmm. says, two names, one from each uh, part of your background, you might say, mm -hmm. was fairly common in that time. So then we will move on to a couple of other things in this chapter. In verse 11, where Jesus is baptized, he hears a voice from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And in Mark, there's no indication that anybody else heard this heavenly voice. It seems to be one that only Jesus heard. Uh, but in, 
in uh, later gospels, it, be, it is depicted as a more public event that others also heard. So there's that difference there, that this was a private experience, but we have to wonder how the experience was passed down. Evidently, Jesus told somebody mm -hmm. in the course of his uh, uh, ministry and his disciples passed this experience down and they passed it down perhaps differently in the different gospels. And we have uh, also the temptation of Jesus in verse 12, the spirit immediately, there we go again, mm -hmm. drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness and tempted and with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. But in this version, unlike some of the later gospels, we have no record of what was recorded between Jesus and Satan. So there, in this verse, in this uh, uh, gospel, it is a private transaction, mm -hmm. and we can assume that it was later uh, told to uh, disciples who later uh, made that aware. The voice of God appears twice in this gospel, and God speaks directly to Jesus in those times. And the audience learns, the reader uh, or the listener learns that Jesus was tested by Satan, but uh, in this account, the audience knows things that others don't know because it was a private meeting, a private experience. And we go on to uh, verse 24. There's another term used where he's, he's uh, casting out an unclean spirit. And the spirit cries out and he says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now that was a term that had been used in referring to previous prophets. Elisha uh, in 2 Kings, uh, that term was used. A prophet would be an authority to help uh, differentiate the, the evil, the unclean from that which was safe. And sometimes the unclean spirits in Jewish tradition uh, they were considered fallen angels. Mm -hmm. But uh, Barclay does a very interesting account of that time on the victory over evil that was being fought here. Mm -hmm. He basically says that the whole pagan uh, world and, and the existing Jewish world were very much uh, uh, caught up and affected by their fears about demons possessing and taking over and destroying. It was very intensely real. And uh, they, uh, many of them, oh, can you go take that? That's a call we can't miss from one of our parishioners we've been Hello? trying to reach. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Matthew, I'm in the middle of a Bible study. I can't talk now. Can we talk after? Okay. I, I can't talk now. Thank you. Bye. 
he had Marianne's phone number come up, but it's not Marianne. Okay, whatever. <laughs> at any rate, the, the world out there at the time, the collective word for demons were those who do harm. And there was a strong fear about it. And there was a demon for blindness and a demon for leprosy. Uh, there were demons that just simply overall uh, kept people dumb and quiet, unable to fend for themselves. And in Mark, uh, the, the demons or unclean spirits have an important role. Mm -hmm. And we also know that in that time of so much chaos, the fears that were stirred up by the conflicts that were, uh, that destroyed the temple and in the aftermath in which the whole Jewish uh, community as it were, had been deprived of its base, the, the temple was where they worshiped. That was where God resided in a sense. Mm -hmm. And with that temple destroyed, where was God? And so we see in this book that the whole issue about healing becomes very, very important. And we will see uh, some of the healings that are uh, described here. And one thing I learned today, I was preparing for my homily on Sunday, that the healings were in Mark are kind of sandwiched in between Jesus exercising his authority to teach. So it is like the two went together. <clears throat> if you could teach authentically, and in that time, the, uh, the rules were proliferating in the Jewish system where there were more and more rules being written to try to uh, sound out what they thought the Lord intended them to do, and the rules proliferated and became kind of a burden to people. And so Jesus comes along and takes a completely different uh, view. His authority rested in the fact that he lived it. He knew the words of scripture so thoroughly and they were internalized as a part of him. And when he spoke, it was with authority, not a, a, a pompous know-it-all teacher. We all know who those people are. We've all been subjected to them from one time to another. But for him, the teaching was real. It was really a part of who he was. And we know here at St. Matthew's, we've seen good teaching that in itself brought healing for people. I know it did for me because I had to undo a lot of my earlier uh, uh, being influenced by fundamentalist theology that was really a burden. And to come under good teaching gave such a relief and gave healing in its own right. So we will see the Jesus in the book of Mark uh, exercising that authority to teach and exercising that ability to bring healing. And we will look at some of those incidents. And this Holy One of God was one who, like the prophets, was able to separate out the fear and the evil and to bring people to a place of healing. And that is the core of what we see uh, in the uh, book of uh, Mark. 
Father John, you want to add any thoughts you have? Well, I had just a, a couple of thoughts in, in general about uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, Barclay calls it the, the essential gospel. And uh, one of the reasons why he says that is that uh, there are 661 verses in the book of Mark. And of that, uh, the, the uh, synoptic gospels, the gospels of uh, Luke and Matthew and Mark, Matthew uses 606 of the verses uh, from Mark's gospel which is about 50 and uses about 51% of his actual words. So uh, Luke likewise has uh, about 1200 verses, 1144, and he uses uh, 320 of Mark's word got verses and 53% of the same words. Uh, and there are only 24 verses of Mark that do not appear in either Matthew or Luke. So when we're looking at a consistency of a message, we can see that uh, Mark's gospel is essential not only for what he puts down in the gospel, but it's also uh, foundational for the gospels of Matthew and Luke, and therefore is very significant as, as a part of our study to understand how essential um, Mark's gospel is. It's the shortest, but in many ways, simply the most essential. Yeah. Yes, very good. That's very helpful. And that is very true. Sometimes the order of things changes, or the emphasis changes, but the, the words are used very heavily. And uh, Mark was there first, we believe, from all that we know from historical uh, sources and the fact that the later Gospels used it. Any other thoughts or ideas or questions from any of you tonight? Well, what you can do... Oh, Polly. Oh, Polly. Go, Polly. Miss my girl, she always comes up with the best questions. You said that uh, Jews were intensely afraid of the demons, of bad spirits, demons. Was that because the demons were randomly striking at people? Or was there any feeling that people had somehow attracted or called the demons by their own behavior or thoughts toward them. So were they random or were they My guess it may be some of each. I think we shall say that their diagnostic abilities in that time, I'm not sure how well they sorted it out, but some of these they would even go so far as to say you inherited something uh, where a, a parent did something wrong, or they would say that you did something wrong and you brought it on yourself, or in some cases uh, where it may have seemed more random. Any other thoughts on that, John? Well, I think... Um as far as the personification of, uh, of demons, you know, the, somebody running around in a red suit with a pointed tail and a pitchfork, I think that, uh, that had a lot to do with the fact that uh, we, at that time, humankind was not real sophisticated in terms of, uh, you know, disease, uh, pathology, uh, things of that nature. And so a lot of what we would recognize today as perhaps uh, some sort of pathology was uh, was was given the, was given over to the power of demons. Then that would be the specific types of uh, personification. Now we, in our 21st century uh, post technology mentality, we may poo poo that, but yet we have all, and I'll go out and say it myself, and I'm sure each and every one of you have experience. 
uh, demonic events, demonic events that have no uh, no real uh, uh, physical reality, and the only thing that we can attribute it to is something outside of our our conscious uh, awareness as being demonic. So as uh, Mother Martha said, I think it's a, a combination of both. There's that element of those uh, demonic forces that were out there uh, personified and also the things that just overwhelm, uh, overwhelm us as human beings that we have no explanation for. Well, the other thing I want to leave you with tonight that to me is crucial and that is when Jesus healed, it was always personal, all right? We can think of modern day attempts at healing emotional or psychological uh, problems with the use of therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, good therapy forms a relationship with a person and can help bring about healing in some cases. In that era, of course, they didn't have those understandings. Whatever the source of the malady, it could be both physical and emotional and spiritual. But the basic thing to remember is Jesus never healed anonymously. He was always yep. a person-to-person -person encounter where Jesus would ask yep. the person, what do you want? What can I do for you? Uh, and it was a personal exchange. And that is the core of hearing, healing from a psychological or a spiritual standpoint. Any healing I've had has been through the avenue of something very personal. Mm -hmm. It's not just come that I read some idea out of a book mm -hmm. or whatever about healing. Right. It was a specific touch, if you will, even physical touch or emotional, spiritual touch. Mm -hmm. So think about that as you read mark's gospel this week yes john uh, um you're speaking about jesus's healings was personal but in the terms of uh, demons he didn't much care who it was he he banished them from the, from that person um that, that's my thinking um, yes he had the authority to have that command over them. So we have to go. Tammy has to leave for another meeting. But you can write me an email or write me on Facebook. Write on, on St. Matthew uh, Bible Study Group. Write input and write any additional comments or questions. Read chapter one and read chapter two. And I like this format. This is much better than the, the streaming from before. I like to see everybody. Did the, did, did the disciples or John Mark, did they banish demons? Yes. Yes, they were given that authority to do that. Okay. So that's very important, John. That's end. Okay, Lord. Thank you for this precious group, people we can share with and learn with. Thank you for Father John and his leadership. Thank you for each one who's come. And may we study and ponder this week on your healing and how you heal us and how you teach us to help heal others. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Gay. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye, Bye Rebecca. Rebecca.